Hi, my name is Professor Don Patterson. Hello to all my students out there. Today I'm going to film a lecture on generics in the Java programming language. This is part of the Abstract Models for Concrete Problems in Java course taught at Westmont College um, CS30, at least today. So let's jump into it. Talking about generics from 10,000 feet, meaning from a very high level, what are we talking about? Generics is a term, a term of art, used in Java to describe the way in which types themselves can be parameterized. What kind of types? Well, classes and interfaces, and um, methods actually as well. And what you need to know about generics is the input to generics are types, and the output of generics are new types. They're a little bit like parameters and methods. Parameters take in data, parameters are a way for methods to take in data, but generics are different because they're not about data, they're about type. They are not about the values, they're about the type of the values. And in that way, you can really call them information that um, is best regarded as metadata. The reason why we like them is because a lot of times the sort of algorithmic work that we do doesn't depend on the specific type that we're working with, it has to do with how we move those types around regardless of what data is in them. So it lets us reuse the same code with different kinds of data inputs because we've described the type inputs in a way that's consistent. All right, so what are the benefits? Well, the benefits are we write less code. Because we can allow one kind of code to work with many different types because it's written generically, uh, they enable us to not generate as much code, and they also allow us to spend more time on the code that we do write to make sure that there are less bugs. They enable us to put more and more, be more efficient as well. Because generics are built into the Java programming language, they give us the ability to check types at runtime. And that means that we're able to find more errors when we're, when we're writing our code than maybe um, perhaps when someone's running it out in the wild after you've sold the program or someone, some customer is using your program. And that's done through static type checking. Let me give you an example of the way it, um, a, a good system works, a good development process works. Someone is a developer, that's the person over on the far left, and obviously not working by themselves, working in a team, but for the purposes of discussion, we'll just treat it as if it's one person representing the team. That group of people are working at an integrated development environment, an IDE, and they're writing code, like this little bit of source code. If you're working in a good IDE, that code is constantly being compiled on the fly, identifying bugs that can be identified at compile time, or static type checking. And then eventually, the developing, developer team feels pretty good about it, and they package up their code. If it's Java code, they package it up in a jar of some kind, and they distribute it. They put it on the internet, they put it in some kind of store, they sell it. Someone, some um, customer, represented here by this fine-looking gentleman with a scarf and gray hair, gets that software and runs that software on their computer in a Java virtual machine that interprets the bytecode that's in that jar, and great things happen. In a perfect world, this is how it should work. Generics help to support the development of this particularly perfect world. So let's take a look at um, an implementation of generics, just right out of the gate so we understand what we're talking about. Let's see how it eliminates the need for doing casting of types in Java. So if we look at the top code, this first code snippet that doesn't have generics requires casting. So what are we doing in this code? In the first line, we define a variable called lowercase l list, which is of type list, and we initialize it using the constructor of ArrayList to become a new ArrayList. Uh, we're able to do this because list is a superclass of ArrayList. List implements everything that ArrayList implements, and ArrayList implements more. Okay, so we have something called list, and it is of type list. In the second line, we decide that we're going to add something to our list. We add the string hello. And in the third line, we retrieve that element from our list. We assign a variable s, which is of type string, and we want to get that zeroth element out of our list. So we call list.get0. Because there's no information in our programming language about what type was stored in position 0, when it comes back, before we can assign it to the string s, we have to cast it to a string. We put the word string in parentheses 
And what that does is it causes the compiler to force to assume that what is coming back from the list is a string. Now this is a problem because we don't necessarily know for sure that what's in there is a string. Now in this simple code, we can look and we can see clearly there's a string in that code. But that third line in a real software program is often not written as closely to, um, in, in space, in, in the software, as those first two lines. So a developer might not actually be able to guarantee that what's in that list is a string. And if you force by casting what is coming out of your list to be a string and it's not a string, you get a runtime error. When we rewrite this code using generics, we're able to keep track of what type is being stored in our string and our Java in interpreter, our IDE, can help us to uh, make sure that our code is well written. So in the second case, what we do is we define a list called lowercase l list, but we give it a type, not just of list, but we put in these angle brackets the word string, indicating that the thing that's going to be in our string is different, uh, the, sorry, the thing that's going to be in our list are different strings. And we initialize that by calling the constructor of array list. We put angle brackets there and we say, well, we're constructing an array list that's going to contain strings. So when we get a reference to that array list and store it in list, from here on out, the compiler is able to confirm that we are only adding and removing strings from our list. So in the second line, when we do list.add the string hello, everything works fine because hello is in fact a string. In the third line, we don't have to use the casting mechanism because when we call list.get0, the compiler knows, because it knows what type list is, and it, we, when we gave it a type, we told it that it was going to contain strings. The only thing that can come back is strings, because the compiler also enforced that the only thing that's added to it is strings as well. So we're able to get away without a cast. All right, so this is one of the benefits of generics, and this is how you can see it um, operating in actual code. So let's take a look at the code on the left and the code on the right for a second. And since you're watching this in a video, what I'd like you to do is to pause the video and take a few moments to try and identify what's going on on the left side and the right side and what's different about the two. Can you figure out what the code on the left is doing? Can you figure out what the code on the right is doing? Can you identify what is different? And can you identify whether or not that code is syntactically correct, meaning does it follow the rules of Java programming language for well-formed code? Okay, let's, uh, let's break from this video for a second and cut over to software and let's try and run it and let's see what happens. Okay, I'm in the Eclipse IDE and I've created a project to do this example. And I'm gonna create a new class that's gonna hold this example code. And we'll just call it generics example. Great, and now I have the code here, uh, like a good chef, I have it pre-prepared. And let's bring in the first example, the first example of good code. And we put that up there and let's format it. All right, and so the first thing we see is we see we've got an error on vector. That's because it hasn't been imported. So I'm gonna go ahead and import it. And now that it is imported, we see that we have warnings on it because we haven't given it the generic specifiers, but we don't have to. We can see that we have added our words. We look for the words that are greater than four characters and we add them and then we print them out. So let's get our main method down here and let's add that to our class. And let's format that up. All right, and so what we expect is we expect this to print out all the words that are greater than four letters. Um, let's go ahead and run this. Go to our console, worked great. All right, so now let's add our bad code. Format it up and run our bad example. And you can see we get a crash. And the crash is because of this element right here. When we stored things in vectors, we had presumed we were storing strings, 
But this isn't a string, this is an array of strings. So here, when we try and get it out, we get not a string, but an array of strings. And when we try to cast an array of strings into a single string, this is where we get our error. So line 31, we look down here, line 31. So the effect that we saw is a breakdown in our ideal situation. We were able to write some code in our IDE, we're able to compile it, create a jar, distribute it to the internet, give it to our well-heeled customer over on the right, and when that customer ran it, they got a runtime error because our software compiling system wasn't able to prevent us from making a particular type error that we saw in the previous example. Now this is really a problem because that step of distribution can be very expensive. It can be expensive in terms of just the marketing costs for getting your software out there, but also the time of our customers who you maybe have one shot at convincing them that you're a professional developer and write, write um, well-formed software. This person not only has tried your software, but has found it to be buggy. And so you've probably lost a customer. We don't like this happening and generics help us to avoid that. All right, so let's take a little bit, a, another look at this code and let's look at it implemented with generics. And let's see what's different about these two sides of the code. I'll give you a second to pause the video and analyze these two code segments to try and understand what's happening be between the two. Okay, what did you notice? Did you see how the code on the left when we decided to add a word to our long words list, our long words vector, that we were able to do it. And on the right, we were able to do it with the exact same code. So it wasn't the same line that was different. But down in the bottom, when we retrieved elements from our list, we didn't have to cast it. This lack of casting is what we saw in that very first introduction to generics. All right, that's fine. Casting is kind of a minor inconvenience. But here's a more compelling example of why generics are valuable. In this code here, I'll give you the two different sets of code again. I'll give you a chance to take a look at it. Pause the video, look at the code, and when you're ready, continue. All right, so in this case, what we have is we have an example of the first it's like the first set of code that we analyze side by side. The left side and the right side differ only because we're adding to our list not an element of our list, not an element of our vector, but instead we're adding the vector itself. When we didn't have generics, we weren't able to recognize this. And so our code shipped and eventually got to the customer where we had a bug in our code. Well, in this case, because we've defined our vector with generics, when we attempted to add something that was not a string, which is what we declared our vector would contain, our compiler was able to stop us and recognize that there is a bug in our code, drawing it to our attention and actually not allowing our code to run. This is a great win because it prevents us from making small, maybe uh, you know, typo errors in our code, but it, the, it, it helps the compiler work as a tool to make us write better software. And so in our example here, what happened is we're writing our code and we passed it off to the compiler and the compiler was able to, to recognize that there was an error long before we ever got to the distribution stage, long before we were ever in front of our customer who maybe would see our code break as a result. So we like this motivation for generics. Okay, so the thing that I think is really neat about generics is not using them, not the way that we use them, although it's good to have some error correction, but I think it's really neat the way that we implement them. So when we think about the person that wrote the code that implements the vector class, that person didn't know what was gonna be stored in the vector. And here's an example. On the left side, we can see some code in which what we're storing in the vector is a string. And on the right side, we can see that what we're storing in the vector is something I'm calling an identity. And in this case, you can see that the identity is full of um, we see that we're calling the vector tall people. And what we do is we go through our parameter that comes in, that comes into our method, and we pull out all the people who are tall and add them to this vector. And then we can print them out. The person that implemented the vector didn't have to write two different versions, a version for strings and a version for identity. They wrote one version because they wrote it generically. And that's what I think is kind of interesting.
we can use vector, we can use any generic class with any kind of type we want. Composing our type of both the vector word, but also the type word next to it as well. We're composing a class out of multiple different types. So let's look at how we actually implement this. So here's an example of maybe a hypothetical identity class. An identity class which contains a string, which is the stored name of the person that we're trying to keep track of. Maybe we're keeping track of a password for them. Now in real practice, please don't ever store a password like this. This is bad practice. There's a lot of good practices for keeping track of pa passwords, but this is just for a teaching example. So don't actually store a password like this. And maybe we're also gonna keep track of their height. This is a real basic class. It consists of a constructor, it consists of some getters for your name and your password, and it also cons consists of um, a setter at the, at the bottom. All right, straightforward class that encapsulates three instance variables, one of which, um, two of which are strings and one of which is um, an integer. All right, we think to ourselves, in order to implement this in a way that uses generics, we need to make sure that we understand the, met, the way a method signature looks, what it, what's, it's, what it is composed of. So let me walk through this so that we can see what we're working with. So this is a component, these are the components of a method that we have within our class. First of all, we see its visibility. Some sort of identifier, typical ones are private, public, and protected. And these indicate who is allowed to use this method. Is it only allowed to be used within our class, private? Or is it allowed to be used by anyone who has access to our class, public? All right, so that's our first one. The second one we have is a type that describes its return type. When our method is done, what does it give back when it's called? Fine. The third part is the name of our method. This is a name that we choose in order to describe it, to help reflect what it does. Then we've got a list of parameters. In this case, we've got two parameters, two strings, and those types are string. We also have the name of the parameter, and that's useful for being able to identify it within the body of our method. All right, so this is Java 101. But what generics are, are generics are a small language. It's a language within a language. It's a language within Java that enable us to change our, the declaration of our types. We can use a generic de declaration anywhere we have these types. We need to make sure that they have some particular rules, some particular consistency rules, though, when we're actually developing them. So now we're making a distinction here. Previously, up to this point, all we've done is looked at using classes, which are generic classes. That means that we create, for example, a vector or an array list, and we add within angle brackets the type that's going to be stored within there. That's what someone who uses a generic class does. Now we're moving into a discussion of how do you write a generic class? How do you write a class so that someone can call it with any kind of type they want and you can work with it? What I want to do is I want to work through this for you and look at a couple different examples of it. Okay, so the motivation here is that we are clever hackers and we know that most people have first and last names and so we want to support that within our identity class. So we're going to change it. We're going to make our identity class, which has a stored name, we want to add, it, add the ability to have a first and a last name to our class. All right. But not only do we recognize that that's a need, but we also recognize that what we're about to do is more general than, it's more than applicable just to names. There are a lot of cases where you might want to store two strings coupled together. Let's just call that generically a pair, and let's try and implement that. What we would think of initially is maybe to write a class like this, a pair class. Within it are uh, two strings, a first and a second string, stored first and stored second. When we want to create a pair, we call the new uh, reserved word and we call the constructor. In this case, the constructor takes in a first and a second. It stores it within the class. And now that pair class can be moved around, keeping the first and the second um, components together. Notice we don't need to necessarily be storing names here. We can be storing any two strings. And then we have getters and setters for the first and second elements so that we can use this class as a utility. Okay, so now we take this pair class over on the left and we want to add it to our identity class and we'll call the new, this version of the identity class identity name. And you can see that we've replaced stored name with a pair. Internally, we're going to have an instance variable called stored name, but we're going to, it's not going to be a string, it's going to be a pair.
Now, when someone uses our identity name class, they're going to pass in as three separate parameters, a first name, a last name, and a password. And then internally, we're going to create a pair class that stores that first name and last name and just keep that as an instance variable. And everything else remains the same. My, we are clever hackers. Look at what we've done. We've very cleverly kept the first and last name together in a helpful pair class that we've created that keeps strings together. Wow, this is very efficient. It's very abstract. It uses the principle of encapsulation. It's, you know, not a bad, not a bad stab at solving a problem. Mission accomplished, right? Oh, it, mission was accomplished. And in fact, you're a victim of your own success. Word has traveled far and wide about what a good programmer you are. And now you've been hired by an EMR company, electronic medical records company. And this company wants you to modify your code now. They want you to modify it to keep track of BMI. That stands for body mass index. They want you to add this to your identity class. Well, body mass index, that's derived from your height and your weight. Hey, that sounds a little bit like the pair class that we just implemented. And we've already done that, right? So that should be a really fast fix to our code. We'll just throw a new pair in there called stored pair. And when we call our identity class, we'll ask someone who calls our constructor to call it with a first name, a last name, a password, and now the new height and weight. We'll store it in a pair called stored BMI. We'll use our pair class. Everything is fine. No, everything is not fine. As you can see here, when we go to create our pair class internally, we're going to, we try and store the height and the weight. But the height and the weight aren't strings. The height and the weight are two doubles. And so if we try and get a double and a double into our pair class, the type checking doesn't work. Because when we wrote our pair class, we said that it takes strings in. Likewise, when we create a getter, that gets our BMI and tries to calculate our BMI based on the height and the weight that we have stored within our class, it all breaks down because what the pair returns when we call get stored first or get stored second is a string. And we can't do math on strings without doing extra work. All right, this is a problem. Well, you know, it's easy enough to fix because we already have that pair class. Let's just make, make another pair class. And this pair class is going to be the same thing, but we're going to call it pair double double, one long word. Internally, instead of keeping track of two strings, we'll keep track of two doubles. And we'll have a constructor where we take in a double for the first one, a double the second, a get stored first returns double. So now we have two utility class, pair, which takes a pair of strings, and pair double double, which takes in two doubles. You may not know it, but I'm in California. And so anytime I say double double, I immediately think of In-N-Out. It's a really good hamburger. I recommend it if you're ever anywhere near an In-N-Out hamburger chain. We're blessed with that in Southern California. Well, conceptually, our pair class is actually kind of agnostic to what kind of type gets stored with it. It didn't really matter for the purposes of writing that pair class what was being stored in first and second. But Java language is tying our hands, at least as we've used it, because we can't write versions that store different things. We're stuck having to make a new class every time we need a different application with different types. This is the motivation for generics. Being able to write a class that's agnostic to what sort of type is being stored within it, but manipulates those types as atomic units. So generics let you manipulate these parameters without knowing what their type is going to be when it's used, but without losing that benefit of static type checking that our programmer likes before shipping off the code to the distinguished gentleman with the scarf. The way that we're going to do this is we're going to introduce a new syntax. When we want to create our pair, and we'll call this one pair generic because it's using generics, we're going to add those angle brackets on the implementation side with some letters that we choose. These letters are type parameters. Typically, parameters that are used here are capital T, that's really common. Capital U, capital V are also common. In this case, I'm using a capital F and a capital S to represent the type of the first and the second um, uh, data element that we're storing. Now notice, these aren't describing the data parameters, they're describing the type of the data. So as we write the rest of our generic pair class, Anytime we previously would have used string and string or double and double, we replace it with F and S. So our instance variable stored first is of type F. 
and our instance variable of stored second is s. Well, that's fine, good. We have some sort of abstract type that we're working with. But now in the rest of the code, we need to make sure that the types are consistent. So for example, in our constructor, whatever the user is gonna pass in, that first element has to be of type f. And that second element has to be of type s. And so in the signature for the constructor, we declare f and s as being our two types. Well, likewise, when we create our getter for get stored first, the thing that we're gonna return is gonna be of type f. And the thing that we're gonna return from get second stored second is gonna be type s. And when someone wants to set the first, what they pass in is something of type f for stored first. And when they wanna set something in the second, it has to be of type s for stored second. Now by writing it in this way, we're writing a pair class that can be implemented with any types for the first thing or the second thing. They could actually be the same, but they don't have to be. They're not forced to be the same. Now when we go to implement our, our EMR application of our identity class, and we call it identity generics, we're able to use our new generic pair class with these type parameters. So now we're using our pair class that we have written to accommodate generic types. And you can see now that we, when we use it, when we go to create our instance variable stored name, we have to commit to what is going to be that F and what is going to be that S. We commit at this point to them being strings. And from that point on, Java can understand that when we're working with stored name, the first and the second have to be of type string and string. Well, that third one down, where we're keeping track of stored BMI now, we're using that same code, but when we declare that variable, we're committing to what those generic type parameters are going to be. And in the second case, although we're using the same code, we're committing that and for stored BMI, F is double and S is double. As we write the rest of our code, the Java programming compiler is able to, is able to enforce that. So in our constructor, you can see we take in a first name, a last name, a password, a height, and a weight. They're of type string, 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 double, double. And when we, when we store elements in our instance variables, we create a new pair of type string, string, and of type double, double, we store two strings and two doubles in those types. And for the rest of the code, we're able to, we, the, the compiler is able to confirm and knows that when we, for example, down in get BMI, it knows that when we get the stored first from stored BMI, that's gonna come back a double and then we can compute with it. And it's able to know that because we committed to it using the generic structure. Now our mission really is accomplished. This is really 80% of everything that you have to know about generics. It really is basically that easy. It's pretty straightforward. And when you work with them a little bit, you'll understand a little bit better how to use them. There are a few details that you need to know. And this is sort of the final 20%. And these can give you a few gotchas sometimes. The first one is that generics and primitive types don't play well together. Primitive types are those types like lowercase i, n, t, int, that we inherited from the C language or the C++ language. Generics are very much in an object-oriented post-primitive world. And so as a result, you can't use primitives in generics. For example, in this first case, you can't create a new pair generic with lowercase i ints. You have to use capital I integers if you want to make a generic with integers in it. And you also can't create an array of generics. So you can see in the second example, what we're trying to do is trying to create an array of pair generic double doubles. We're not able to do that because the things that are in our array have to be single classes or primitive types. If we did want to implement the code, the second example of the code, we would use something like a vector or an array list instead, anything that implements the list interface. Okay. The other thing is that sometimes you care as a generic programmer, someone who's writing a method that is going to take in generics, sometimes you care just a little bit about the type. So you do have the ability as someone who's writing a generic class to add some restrictions to the kinds of types that someone who's using your class can commit to with them. So here's an example uh, called pair generic sort of. And you can see that when I declare the type parameter f, and when I declare the type parameter s, I put some restrictions on it. I put restrictions into it saying that, yes, you can store any type you want for f, but it has to descend from the number class. 
It has to be an integer or a double or a number itself. And yes, you can store something in your S class, but it has to actually um, be an extension of a pair double double, which is sort of a complicated idea. And so when someone, when a developer who wants to use this class goes to try and fill in what types they're going to use, the compiler says, okay, you can't put anything in for F. For example, you can't put an S, a string in the place of F. You have to put something that conforms to the number interface. So this gives the generic programmer some ability to control what is being stored. And that's valuable because if you look down at the last method, the one called scale it, it is making an assumption that you can multiply the two things that are stored in first and the thing, um, uh, let's see, it's assuming that you can, you can multiply the element that is in uh, stored first. You can only multiply things that are numbers and so we have to put that restriction on our code. Otherwise, we won't be able to compile our um, scale it method because it's not necessarily the case that you can multiply two generic classes together. So by putting that restriction at the top, we're able to have that scale it code at the bottom. Okay, so let me give you a little task to do. Let's say that you wanted to make a type that was called quad. And like a pair stores two different types within it, a quad is going to store four different types within it. A first, second, third, and fourth. Why don't you think about that and maybe try and implement it in um, your own Java IDE. Pause the video, give you a second to work through what that might look like. All right, what did you come up with? Did it look anything like this? There are actually a lot of different ways that you could implement it. In this case on the left, what I decided to do was to, I decided to leverage a pair that we already had. So you can see that when I declare the quad generic, I'm giving it four generic parameters, S, T, U, and V. Now I've got four different types that I have to manage. And internally, the way I decided to keep track of them was through two pairs, a pair that keeps a type S and T and a pair that keeps track of U and V. Now this is interesting because within the body of the class, I'm committing to a certain type for my pair generic, but what I'm committing to is also a generic class that I took in as input. So what I took in as input becomes the input to another generic class. And you can see that in my constructor, I take in something that is of type capital S and I give it the variable name lowercase s. Type capital T, variable name lowercase t. And you can see then that when I instantiate the instance variables foo and bar, I'm using a very specific syntax where I call the constructor and I use the type parameters when I define the type, pair generic, capital S, capital T. But I use the lowercase variable names, S and T, to call the constructor. And then I have the getters and setters as you can see there. Well, another way that I could have implemented the, um, the uh, quad generic would be to define it the same way with an S, T, U, and V, but instead of keeping track of four different pairs, I could have treated one pair generic as being a parent class and then encapsulated a second pair within me. So in this case, I would use my super class as a place where I would store S and T and then encapsulate a second pair where I'd store U and V. Now, neither of these are the most straightforward way of doing it. The most straightforward way of doing it would be just like the pair, where you had a S, T, U, and V typed instance variable, and you call it first, second, third, and fourth. But these are some alternative ways that you might do it. All right, another gotcha is the fact that generic types are atomic. So if we look at this code, these are three examples of code that's, that are okay, but I present to you in thinking about the way in which type generic types are different. So in the first case, we have three, uh, two different variables, some object and some integer. The first one is of type object and the second one is of type integer. We declare them and we initialize them. We call the object constructor and get back an object. We call the integer constructor and get back an integer. That Actually, that's a deprecated way of doing it now, but that's there. And then we assign the value of some integer to some object. It, that's okay because object is a superclass of integer. Every, every method that object has, integer has as well. So it's okay to go that direction. It would not be okay to go the other direction, assign an object to an integer. In the second case, we declare a method called some method, and that takes in something of type number. 
And so in the second two lines, when we call some method and we call it with an integer and we call it with a double, both of those calls are okay because integer is a subclass of number. And so everything that number has, integer has. Everything that number has, double has. And so we're okay, some method is gonna be fine given an integer or a double. And then finally, in the third case, we have good code as well. We're creating a generic pair where it requires two numbers as its generic types. We instantiate two numbers, foo and bar, of type integer and double. And we, when we call that constructor, we pass in foo and bar, which is of integer and double. Those are both number types, and so we're okay. That works out all right. Now the problem is, is that you get used to this inheritance hierarchy, and you think that that applies to generic types as well. But what you have to remember is that generic types, when you declare an array list of string or a vector of double, that whole type, that whole declaration becomes one type. You can't inherit just parts of it. It's treated as a whole. And so here's an example where that breaks down, where that, where that concept causes your code to break down. What we have is we have an example of a method called sum, which takes in as a parameter a vector a generic vector filled with numbers. It goes through and it does an aggregate sum of everything that's in that vector. That's fine. But when we go to call it, you can see that we declare a variable called bar that is of type vector filled with doubles. We add two numbers to that vector and then we try to call sum passing in our vector of doubles. And the compiler will complain. It will complain because vector double is not vector number. But you say, wait a second, double is a descendant of number, so why doesn't that work? The reason it doesn't work is because when the compiler looks at this type, it doesn't see those two types as being fungible, as being interchangeable. It has created a type called vector number, and vector double is a type that's different. And so while over on the left, you can see that double inherits from number, which inherits to object, that's fine. On the right, Vector double does not inherit from vector num number, which does not inherit from vector object. Instead, what we have is a situation where object is the superclass, vector number is one descendant, and vector double is a different and unrelated descendant. So that sometimes will trip people up when they're using these. Okay, here's an example of a method that's generic by itself. So far, we've looked at generic classes, but here's an example where we don't work with the rest of the class, we just write a particular method. How would you call this? Let me give you a second to um, see if you can figure out what it might look like to call this. Pause the video and give it a shot. Okay, here's another example. A previous example was here. Now, what happens in this case if you pass the wrong type into the second parameter? Let me pause for a second, give you a chance to try it out, see if you can figure out what's ha what happens. Finally, let me give you a tricky example. This is an example that breaks. Here's an example of a method called fill, that takes in an array of elements of type T, and it is going to um, fill that array up with elements, with the value element. So it'll fill up an array. When we call it, we can create an array of strings called A, and we can call this generic method with A as the first parameter and 42 as the second parameter. That's a problem because we can't fill up an array of strings with 42. What happens is, is this is actually going to compile OK. And the reason why it's going to compile OK is because Java is going to look at that code and say, OK, what is it, what is the type T that Phil is being called with? And it's going to assign T to be the object class, not the string class. And since 42 can also be converted into an integer class, which is a descendant of type object, it interprets the, variable, the type parameter t as being object. And so then when we try and fill array position i with value, it, it ends up failing because we try and put an in, uh, integer value into that. 
So the the you end up getting a runtime error. The call compiles with t equal to object. The choice is justified because a string array is convertible to an object array, and 42 can become a new integer um, 42 that's convertible to an object as well. But when the program tries to store the integer into the string array, you end up getting this exception. An exception is thrown. So the bottom line is this is a really complicated error. And the thing to remember is don't mix generics and primitive arrays. Use array lists and you'll be much safer and the compiler will work with you. Okay, final check for you. Is this code going to compile? Let's try it out and see if it works. All right, in summary, generics from 10,000 feet. What did we look at? Generics enable types, meaning classes and interfaces and actually methods as well, to be parameterized, something we haven't seen until we've talked about generics. The input to generics are types. For example, string is an input to an array list of strings. And the output of generics are new types, an array list where we've committed to string using angle brackets. They're like parameters and methods, but they're not types. They're not, they are types. They're not data and they're not values. They're metadata. They're information about the data. And they let you reuse the same code with different inputs. All really great things that we like about generics. Your benefits are that you end up writing less code, you use code, get code reuse. It enables programmers to implement generic algorithms. You get stronger type checks at compile time. So your distinguished gentleman with the scarf does not see buggy code. More errors are filed, filed, found at compile time through static checking. Thank you very much. I hope this helps you to write well-formed, efficient, bug-free code. Happy hacking.